I forgot where <coughs> we where we stopped last time. Could somebody tell me? Tell me. Still on the five hindrances? Yeah, we did greed, ill will, drowsiness, and dullness. Okay, drowsiness and dullness. So we come to the big point, <coughs> the restlessness. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm right. Restlessness and worry. <laughs> you mentioned about that restlessness and worry. Somebody was so restless and so worried. No. Well, I went to school today to teach meditation at school again. Nice. Nice, yeah. Well, we had almost 50 kids all together, right? With two classes. Two classes. Two classes. You know, two classes. But it was nice. What ages? What ages? Grade two, three. Grade two, three, four, and five. So, eight to ten adults. Yeah, yeah. So these are the two teachers here. Sorry, you have to show yourself. So um, I was so touched. I was so touched by the kids. Firstly, because they remember my name. Probably the teacher told them. Oh no. Oh no. They remember me. <laughs> Secondly, they remember what they have learned. Of course, the teacher has done good work to keep on reminding them, practicing with them, and uh, you know, as soon as I, they, they just sit there and close their eyes. <laughs> Perfect, really. I mean, I think just there was just like one, one, everybody for the first class, Laurie's class, Everybody was so quiet and so trying their effort to be focused, except one one little guy. You know, he's you know making guns and all that. But this, he still has his eyes closed. Sometimes he opens and look at me. But it was okay. It was okay. But it was it was so nice. And I said, so you know what you have learned from me last time. So they knew, mindful seeing, mindful eating, mindful. Um, feeling and mindful hearing and mindfulness of their breath. Oh gosh, I said, wow. And then we go on to, I, we, we actually we started off with a program in our head, but we got carried away <laughs> without any program. We just carry on. And it was, it was amazing to see how they actually be so honest about their own feelings. And uh, a couple of them said, "I said, have you have you you know, uh, do your have you done your homework, you know?" And they said, "Oh yes." I said, "What did you do? Mindful eating." My mom said, "Why do you eat so slow? <laughs> every every dinner, I'm the last one to finish." <laughs> I said, "Then you have to do your own dishes." She said, "Yes, I will." And then the next next one said, "I do mindful eating too, and sometimes." I do mindful breathing. It's great, you know. It's so good. It's it's really nice. And the second lot, the the younger kids. Of course, we do little, you know, shorter meditation. But I have seen. I saw. Well, one, two. They were very fidgeting last time, and this time they just go on. The little guy at the back. Yes. Last time he was like. <laughs> <laughs> and this time he just sat there and he answered questions he put his hand up he was oh I am surprised I'm so surprised and oh, I, I'm, I shouldn't be surprised but I said I'm, I'm happy I'm inspired I'm touched by the two classes you, you teachers have done a great job let us keep on doing that okay and uh, so I think I think with your own experience in meditation, it will actually um, reinforce their their practice too. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could do it more often uh, with you know high school or, or, or secondary school? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Hey, you come back tomorrow, then because you're gonna get one more or two. Thank you, God. Right? Yeah. I said, wow, well, well. and uh, some of the kids have 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 taken my class, but they were not in their class anymore. So 
they, they left him, but they said, Sister Jesse, Sister Jesse, they you. It was, yeah, it was really, really, really touching, you know. And I hope this, you know, this seed in them, they will keep nourishing it and nourishing it. Then they build up that strength to actually face their own life. They have a long life to face. A very, a very lot may may have a lot of difficulties, may have a lot of restlessness and worry to deal with, right? And only with that such a strong and powerful mindfulness one can deal with that. It's not easy. So when we we know that when we worry, our mind doesn't settle, and our mind is sort of like floating and you know becoming restless and and and. And that's why, you know, restlessness and worry always go hand in hand together. Always. When you worry, your mind, your body sort of like, oh, I want to sit, but I want to stand, and I want to lie down, and I want to sit, I want to stand, I want to lie down. So it's, they all go hand in hand together. Why would you, why, why do you think, like physiologically, why do you think that somebody is restless? Physiologically. Not 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 like not dharmically. Mm-hmm. Why? Is it is the mind sort of manifesting in the body? Right? Yeah. So they're they're unsettled in their mind so their body's restless. Yeah. So At first that, that 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 also and sometimes physiologically somebody has too much energy in the upper part of the body. Mm-hmm. That becomes very re- restless. So you know, um, for example, when you when you feel so like a lot of heat up here, you become very easily become very restless. And of course, this is the like a mutual thing. If you have a very stressful mind, there, then 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 that that mind will result in extra energy, the heat or um, an an you know unpleasant energy building up around the upper part of the body that's physiological you know a uh, 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 phenomenon so how, how can we how can we deal with this um, uh, it, we can go diving into the ocean and cool down the body or we can or we can just observe and the, the, some teachers say that restlessness and worry they, is compared to like a slave like as if that we are a slave, and we work so hard, but we never get compliments from our our owners, right? And we keep on working and working and working and and becoming so nervous and anxious because we never know that whether our 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 what do you call those people, Master. the masters, whether those masters are happy with your work or not. You you're constantly in that kind of anxiety mode, right? <laughs> you think people work too hard? Not in Canada. Too much? Not in Canada. No? No. No. You ask Eva. <laughs> oh. yeah. No, not in Canada. We, dis- we had a discussion yesterday about the uh, banner and the, the banner for the uh, festival this end of the month. I said, you, you guys need to give me the dimensions. I need to ask the designer to design that. And the designer said, Sifu, what is the dimension? I said, I'm still waiting for the dimension. I said, you know, this is what our vision is. This morning he already gave us a, he already gave us a, a design without the dimension. <laughs> and I, I showed to Eva on the way out to the school at 8.30 in the morning. I said, Eva, this is the design. She said, you kidding, Sifu? You got the design already. I said, come on, this is not... This is not Canada. This is Hong Kong. People work like like this, like this. Not in Canada. People, people, it's too fortunate in Canada. You know, too really, too fortunate because you don't really need to worry too much. If you are unemployed, you get unemployed insurance. So why bother to work if you are? Not well, and you got disability allowance. Why bother to work so hard? You know, and if you are sort of, you know, whatever that difficulties you have, you always have some resources to help you to get by. And you know, so not not in Canada. 
I, well, it's not fair for me to say that. Like, you guys work very hard. <laughs> but not you know, generally speaking, generally speaking, do you mean that work, work, well, or yeah. practice? I'm just thinking that if somebody didn't take the time to um, calm themselves, like if they're always in a work state and busy, yeah, like maybe I mean busy, busy, <coughs> that they don't take that time to off. Yeah, yeah. So it's not necessarily the work. It's actually the, the 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 mind is constantly you know on the go, and the body is constantly on the go. Like me, constantly on the go. And Eva asked me this morning, "I don't know how you can do it." I said, "How I can do it? Without meditation, I cannot do it." So two hours daily meditation that helped me to replenish my own energy, so I can go on and do all this work. I never, I, I really, I seldom stop, right? I, I, I go to bed at 12 and get up at 6 in the morning, every day, almost. Sometimes I, I go to bed at 2 and still get up at 6. How can I do it? Sometimes I yawn a bit and even say, you tired? Yes, I say, I'm tired. I close my eyes for 10 minutes, I come back and feeling very refreshed. You need, you have something to say? At that time, yeah, yeah, in the past. But that's a long time ago. That was a long time ago, yeah. yes. I remember my mother, my, my parents used to work very hard. Yeah, yeah. but at that time working there, there at that time the, the, the goal of working is actually very simple, was very simple, just to sustain the family. But now, that crazy work is to fulfill the craving. So it's actually very different. With just that intention set out, it's very different and it actually burns up a lot of energy. Agree? Sort of, yeah. Okay. So, the more you worry, the more restless you will become. So, try to, try to be observant, okay? Worry. And you, once you start to become aware of that worry, that worry disappears. But the next worry will come up again the next worry will come up again. And that's why we think the worry is permanent. I, why do I have so much worries? No. Actually, each time, each time, each worry is different. So you just have to observe that worry. There's a worry. I address, okay, there's a worry. It's gone. It's gone. The next worry comes up. But because they come up so fast, and so frequent that you think that worry is sort of like a real thing existing. But it is not. So that is, that is the, the, the truth that we, we have to start seeing so that we, can break that we can break that cycle. I've noticed from my experience that the content really doesn't matter. No. It's, just, it's a habit. It, and, I, and I see that. All this, and, then I, and then that one's dealt with, and then like, the content changes. Yeah. Yeah. But underneath it doesn't. No, no. So, yeah, it's true. The content it doesn't change. I mean, the content changes, keep con changes, but that habit pattern is a habit pattern. It's a reactive pattern. So, if you don't correct that from the deep down, you will never be able to deal with that. Okay? It, yes? I remember hearing about um, an experiment that was done, I think it was something like 30 to 50 years ago by some huge corporation like IBM or one of those. And they took salespeople, the top salespeople, and some of the worst salespeople, and they switched their territory. They put the top salespeople in terrible uh -huh. territory and poor salespeople in yeah. excellent territory. And they all did the same. Yeah. It's about what they're used to. It's yes. That's what they found. Yeah. It's about the habit pattern that's the habit pattern. so established. Yes. It's the known is what's comfortable. It, yes, it we talk like about that the, the comfort zone, right? The bubble that we all like to mm -hmm. sit inside and not try to not not allow the bubble to break. Mm -hmm. That's even though that bubble we think is, is is actually not a good bubble, it's not going to lead us to you know the liberation of sufferings, mm -hmm. but we'd rather stay inside yeah. and mm -hmm. and be okay inside there. You think that you're okay, mm -hmm. right? Last week. 
I went to the prison and uh, we had a long talk with one of the one of the buddy there. He had a life sentence and he was like only like he said uh, 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 a ten year for life sentence. So so after ten years he can actually apply for parole. He did not apply for parole, and uh, so two years passed, five years passed. It's seventeen years now for a lifer, which is supposed to actually serve ten years only, and he could be eligible for parole. But he did not apply for parole. Why? Possibly because he felt so safe inside that bubble. He rather stay in that bubble than going out into another bubble. We had that. We 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 saw that very often in in the prison, especially for people staying there a long time. They they don't they don't have that confidence to go out again, because they there are so many worries, so many worries, right? So, yeah, the bubble. So you know uh, this restlessness and worry always come hand in hand. We know that uh, if we want to actually start uh, worrying less and becomes less restless, you really have to do it inside, from here. Don't be afraid to dig in there. Don't be afraid. Only the possibility for you to come out of that, all the difficulty, all the difficulties is to be able to dig in there. Even though how, how raw that it could be, how hurtful that could be, you know, that's the only way out. It could be very raw, it could be very difficult, but it's no way to hide. If you try to avoid, then you try to push it back down again and again, again and again, and decorate them with beautiful flowers like peonies and roses. You never address them. As I said just now, you fall, you stand up, you start again. You fall, you stand up, you start again. And you fall, and you're afraid to fall again. You're afraid, and you try to avoid to fall. You will never take another step, right? So don't be afraid to fall. Don't be afraid to fall. Watch your steps, as I said to the kids this today during meditation. I said, watch, walk, and feel. Watch, walk. And feel. <laughs> that's my that's my slogan for the day. Watch your step, walk your step, and feel your step. So you know, never never be afraid to fall. Never be afraid to fall. Okay. So next one, doubts. Not knowing the right purpose. Not knowing the right direction. Not knowing what you want. And. This is the very this is really you no know, simple doubt. But what 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 he said about doubt is actually doubt about his teachings, doubt about the 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 possibility of releasing yourself from miseries, the possibility of seeking a path out, the possibility of walking on that path, and doubt about the 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 four noble truth mainly. Doubt about oh this life is not full of sufferings. This life is full of happiness. You see, I'm so happy because I'm rich. I'm so happy because I have good food. I'm so happy because I have this Apple phone. I'm so happy because I have all this family around me. I have. I'm so happy because my husband loved me. I'm so happy. All this. No, you are not happy. Sorry. Materially, yes, it's fulfilling, but not happy. That happiness is transient. That happiness is. Is is not from the mind. As happiness is from the fulfillment on the material side. The real happiness cannot be bought with money. Cannot be uh, cultivated because you have such things, such thing. No, the true happiness is in there. And when you are really happy, your skin shines. When you walk, you fly. You do. You don't feel like heavy, and when you talk, people can actually experience your 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 spirit, your happy spirit, and but when you're sulky, they can experience your sulky spirit too. 
right? Yes, bro? I don't think, I don't think that <coughs> happiness can really be expressed. It's something that can only no. be felt. No, yes, 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 yes. So this doubt about the, the, the teachings is actually the, 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 what he actually meant. So when we have this doubt, we are actually constantly in darkness. Yes? I was wondering, if we actually had no doubt, would we live perfectly? No. We would have lived really like a zombie. Because we won't be curious enough to go and, go and search for answers. But we, if we don't have any doubt. If we have no doubt in what the Buddha taught now, right? So yeah. say we all here embraced it fully. Yeah. Um, you don't think we could do anything differently? There's one thing about being able to actually see the reality, right? If mm. we really would be really different than non mm. It's going to really see the way things are. Right. So you're saying that what's really we would be here. Yeah. Yeah, but that doubt is actually is very sneaky. And sometimes it could be very subtle. It's not big doubts. It could be, you know, very little subtle doubt. But uh, he mentioned doubt in this aspect is, you know, the, the doubt about his teachings and so that we you get confused, you get you start to ask why, why am I yes, Mali? Yeah, the experience, yes. Experience. That's why, because when we have doubt, then we will start to look for ways, right? And we will start to experience, and we will start to re no, verify that with our experience, right? Right? Laurie, you understand? Yeah, so you have to have the doubt but to verify it. Yeah, but the doubt, the, the, the doubt at that time is not an obstacle for you to search. But it, if it becomes an obstacle, then that that is a hindrance, right? I guess the difference might be is if you hear some particular phrase or, or something that the Buddha taught, you may have doubt enough to go check it out or try that practice and see if it works. But the other doubt would be, I doubt that will work. So I'm not going to try it. Yes, yes, yes. Like, like the story I shared with you last week about my mom, right? Yeah. And I asked my friend, so is it going to work? He said, I don't know. It depends on you. I said, oh, it depends on me? I thought it depends on your Buddha to come and help me. He said, no, 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 no. He doesn't come and uh, extend a helping hand. Oh, come on. No, 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 you have to walk the path, you have to do the work yourself. So, you know, if I did have doubt at that time, I would stop going further. Right? But sometimes that doubt could be very useful. If it is a good doubt, I doubt about my ability. Okay, let me try. I put my effort in. I think curiosity is better, but this doubt is actually meant that they don't believe in the, they don't be, trust the words of the Buddha. Okay, that that's when it becomes a hindrance. Yes, I have a, a clip report from Buddhist studies, and it refers to this restlessness as being largely erotic in its character. Mm. What's the link? What's the link? Erotic. Just erotic. Like yeah. erotic or neurotic. Or, you know, just, just restlessness. Just couldn't settle down. Some people is like that. You can see that, you know. And especially nowadays with uh, so much attention diverted towards the out outside world, the restlessness become more and more. You see, why people become rest? Why people constantly have to go to their cell phones? To check, to check their messages. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they they are so restless inside that they need to put their attention on there 
And with that, you know, like this. So the fingers the rest on the feelings, touching we the front. My granddaughter stayed over the weekend. She was never not going away. I know. Talking to me I know. She... Yeah. Oh, you get 10 people sitting on the table, 10 people have their cell phone out. <laughs> and not talking with each other. Oh, you talk with me? Okay. Hi, Derek. How are you? Are you enjoying your meal? <laughs> you know, exactly. like that, right? So that's and the we problem. Are the main object of our mind. <laughs> Just peripheral. I know, peripheral. It's, 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 hor it's horrific. I think it's horrible. So remember the four Greek divisions that we, we could go, go, go fast on this. The preventing the arising of unarisen and wholesome states. We, we actually talk about that. Uh, we're going to go in detail. The abandoned and unwholesome states that have you know, already arisen, to arouse the wholesome states that have not arisen, and to maintain and perfect the wholesome states that have already arisen. So these are the great four great divisions of great right efforts. And a lot of time people say that these right efforts have to be uh, put in, in only in meditation practice, which I, which I you know, don't agree with. I think it has to be practiced anytime during the day. Anytime, anywhere, okay? So that is the fall, great, oh, what, what's happening? Okay, so to firstly, to prevent the arising of a recent unwholesome states, so what the Buddha has actually said in this Nikaya, uh, four, chapter 413, he said, Herein the disciple rouses his will to avoid the arising of evil or unwholesome states that have not arisen. So when we, this is, this is to prevent the arising of an arisen unwholesome states, it's actually, this is the front line combat that we have to keep on, you know, having the, the shield that we always have to carry, always, anytime. And when we think of you know dealing with uh, the un arisen unwholesome states, how can we put in the effort to try to prevent it? So what he said in here, he will his will to avoid his will to avoid. That means he's trying to restrain himself having this. Un, un, unwholesome thoughts arising with strain oneself okay and uh, why do we need to actually restrain the arising of this un, unwholesome state because it actually it actually disturbs the balance of our mind when anything unwholesome arises it disturbs our mind. And also when it disturbs our mind, it impairs, it impairs our progress. If it impairs our progress, how can we develop that mindfulness that needed, that is needed, that is required to stay observant when you know when we are faced with challenges? Right? So, and he said, and he makes efforts, stir up his energy, exerts his mind, and strives. You see, there are three parts in here. Stirs up his energy. Okay, I need to take my energy out. I need to do some work. Yes? I think it's good to have uh, an image in one's mind to help. Uh, I'm just reflecting on the monk Hohmann who referred to unwholesome states as being dust on the mirror of the yes. mind. Yes. You yeah. have to blow it off. You have to blow it off. Yes, you have to stir up your energy. I notice there are dust in the mirror of my mind. I need to blow it out. So you take a deep breath and you exert your mind and you blow. And if it's not clean, then you blow again. If it's not clean, you blow it again, over and over again. Sorry, we just have to do it over and over again, over and over again. No, I have been, I have been on this path for so, so long, 
and I still haven't moved a step. So, you know, we just have to keep on going, keep on going. I got a message from a student in China yesterday, and she said, I wanted to become enlightened. <laughs> and I need a good meditation teacher. And you were my meditation teacher last year, and I wanted some guidance. My Sifu, my Sifu, my, you know, the Sifu that actually ordained her, told me that I need to be patient. I need to take my time. And I was, I was reading his, her passage, and she said, because in the old days, there was one person. He knew that his time is running out, and he exerted his energy, and he worked hard, and he worked hard. And within one day, he became enlightened. And I just wanted to be like that. And I look at that passage and I said, how am I going to answer her? <laughs> I'm not enlightened and I don't know how. But I, 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 did, I, did, I did reply to her message. I said, if you want to reach that state, there is no shortcut. There is no shortcut. When you wanted enlightenment so desperately, you already lose that equanimity. And you lose your awareness of the way it is at this moment. And that's, you are walking away from that destination already. You're not in, on the path already. You, are ve you have veered off. And I said to her, as the sixth Patrick said, in your life, every opportunity is a great opportunity for you to become enlightened. You cannot leave that. You cannot, you cannot hide that. You cannot avoid that. You cannot you know, doubt about that. Every life opportunity is a great chance that was a good answer, wasn't it? Perfect. <laughs> yeah, because you want to be fast, sorry, you already lost that equanimity. You lost that balance of the mind. You're not grounded anymore. Yeah, internal states uh, are visible. I remember a lady, uh, there was a cook at uh, the maximum security prison, and uh, she had attended a series of talks on Buddhism that I had given at the university, and not by virtue of me, but the teaching. Uh, I, I met her one day and I said, why, you look like you're wearing the three jewels. She said, I am, I've taken the refuge. Oh, wow. Oh, great. It's very nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, so, so, you know, and, uh, <coughs> and actually, Bhikkhu Bodhi said that um, it is the sense experiences that sparks off the hindrances into activity. It's all the sensual, sensual activities. And he said, because it's the eye to the form, the ear to the sound, and the nose to the smell, and the tongue to the taste, the body to the touch. It's all these outside sense objects continuously impinging us on the, on the senses and send messages to the mind where it is processed, evaluated, and responded. And we did that with the kids today. Uh, we were meditating, and then there was this sound, really loud sound, and then the, the kids were starting to fidget. So after, after that closed eye meditation, I said, so how did you feel with that sound? And he said, annoyed, annoyed. Quite a few kids that annoyed and uh, disturbed. Um, don't like it. Got confused because of the sound. I said, it's the sound. Don't make it to become a noise. When you start to react to that sound, you actually make, turn the sound into a noise. And a noise is negative. But a sound is neutral. It's nothing. A sound is just a sound. A taste is just a taste until you start to like it or dislike it. 
it becomes a good taste or a bad taste. I like this sound. I don't like this sound. This is a pleasant sound. This is an unpleasant sound. Right? So it's all in the mind. So the mind deal with this, all these impressions, all these messages in different ways. Sometimes very carelessly. Sometimes very unwisely. And sometimes very unmindfully. And so these these sense objects, when we deal with them very callously, very unmindfully, and very unwisely, we allow these objects to come into the mind and stir it up. And then when it becomes stirred up, and you start to label them, oh, pleasant, unpleasant, I like it, I don't like it, I want it, I don't want it, mm -hmm. and then you start to react, push it away, or Take it in, take it on, take it on, more, 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 more. Oh, I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't like it, I don't like it. So, so that's, that's how actually we ended up in all these emotions. Sorry. Nothing to do with anybody else. It's all your own thing. 200% is your own responsibility. Nobody asks you to react like that. Is your mind asking you to react like that? But you can't help another person. You cannot help another person. You cannot control another person. But, but you can help yourself. Uh, I was down in Vancouver with my other daughter, and we were watching a whole lot of activities down below us on a, a building site. Yeah. And there was a man beside me, and he said, it's noisy, isn't it? And I don't know what I persuaded him to say, but I turned to him and said, it's the song of the city. It's the sound of a city, yes. The sound of a city. Song of a city. Song of a city. And he fell into step with myself and my daughter and walked along with us with a camera on his shoulder because he was some kind of photographer and he was quite voluble talking mm. about it. Mm. Yeah. So I never thought of it like that. Yes, yeah, song of the city. Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so you know, who who is actually who is responsible to stir up all these reactions? Uh, the greed, the craving, the aversion, the animosity, who? Right here, point the fingers back to you. You are the number one. Look, when you say I'm the number one, there are four, f four fingers pointing to you. There's only one finger pointing upward, away from you, but four fingers pointing to you. <laughs> so you are the totally responsible. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you this. <laughs> okay? So in order to actually to restrain this arising of the unreason, unwholesome states, we need to have control over our reaction to our senses. That's why the Buddha said, when he perceives a form with the eye, a sound with the ear, an odor with the nose, a taste with the tongue, an impression with the body, or an object with the mind, he apprehends neither the sign nor the particulars. Well, neither the sign nor the, nor the particulars. Not, yeah. Pay attention to this, okay? And he strives to ward off that through which evil and unwholesome states, greed and sorrow would arise. And if he remained with unguarded senses, and he watches over his senses, restrain his senses. You see? So he said restrain of the senses doesn't mean that we deny, we deny or we withdraw from the sensory world. We address them. We just address them, but we don't react to them. It's very difficult. Very difficult. And uh, and at that and in, in the Buddha state there was this monk who who, who has difficulty with you know uh, essential pleasures, especially the sexual sexual sensual pleasures. And so this monk the the, the Buddha actually knew that and the Buddha taught him how to observe and uh, taught him the uh, uh, observation of the anatomical parts. And so he, he observed the anatomical parts. What are the anatomical parts? The bones, the flesh, um, the skin, you know, all those things. So he observed and he observed and he observed. And one day he was sitting there and there was this somebody, you know, 
flying by, and he saw he saw this something flying by, and then the next thing there was this angry husband, angry man coming by. He said, "Oh monk, did you see my wife, my beautiful wife, who who fled home?" And the monk said, "Your beautiful wife? I'm sorry, I didn't see any. I see a whole set of skeleton. Is that your beautiful wife?" <laughs> And the monk and the man look at him, thinking, thinking that he was crazy, you know, seeing a whole set of skeleton rather than a beautiful woman. And actually, that helped this monk to overcome his sexual desire. And you know, because we 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 adopt a vow of celibacy, right? So if we cannot overcome this kind of sexual sensual desires, it's going to really be a big challenge. It's very difficult. You know, to 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 keep our monkhood is because we could be easily lose our precepts, you know, break breach our precepts or break our precepts, uh, because like I'm con- yes, I'm constantly in contact with men and with women, and if if we don't have that in our mind, if we don't work that through, it's uh, so difficult because this is a very very big obstacle for for practice. A question about if I think their thoughts wholesome or unwholesome. If they if they just pass through and you don't react, is that it's neither wholesome nor unwholesome. Right. Yes. So it's the reaction that makes it wholesome. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you don't have to try to restrain it as long as you're not reacting. Yeah. 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 But sometimes when the when the when the thoughts arise, you already know it's unwholesome. You want to curse, you know that is un- un- unwholesome uh, thoughts already, and but you just watch it flying by. That's just a thought. It's just a thought, right? Only when that unwholesome thought is being manifested into actions, it become un- unwholesome actions. Right? It's a very good question. Okay, so. So in order to restrain these senses, we need this mindfulness. We need to uh, create understanding uh, when we start to actually deal with these sensual fields. You know, so when the mind turns towards the object, we see. Look, we look at this object. We know. Then we actually apprehend it. Then we we actually perceive this object, and we examine and we identify. Try to identify. Immediately following this identification with this, I, I, I identified this with me, with my eye, with my mind. Then before, before we start to actually have an evaluation of this identification to this object, there is a little space in between, a very tiny space. And that space actually allows you to take a choice whether to Act like this, or to act like this. That's why we always say, start off with no judgment, no identification, no interpretation, no expectation, no labeling, just the way it is. So, before you start to evaluate whether this is nice, this is not nice, whether I like it. Whether I don't like it, there is this gap that we can make a choice, and that could be a wise choice if you have mindfulness, or could become a very bad choice if you don't have any mindfulness. All right, so so we know when this mindfulness is absent. The defilements, the hidden defilements inside our mind, will start to push for an opportunity to surface, and when they surface, they will motivate. They will result in a a, a, a wrongful a wrongful decision. It's just so simple. Okay, so you know that when when with this mindfulness, it holds these hindrances in check. I constantly check myself: Do I have these hindrances? Am I in this sta- mind mind state? So you actually keeping a very very uh, high alert. You are always co- in constant amber alert, but not stressful. 
you're constantly in check with yourself. So you don't, you don't, you don't allow these hindrances to actually lead you away. So that's why have mindfulness plays a big part in this aspect of restraining ourselves from from having all these unreason, unwholesome states to arise. Okay, clear. So much talking today. Mindfulness. <coughs> so we we know that we, it, re, mindfulness is so remembering and noticing and reapplying, constantly reapplying it again and again, again and again. And expanding and extending the moments of mindfulness. Now we have one second of mindfulness. My, being mindful, next time we have two seconds, next time. And sometimes we make wrongful decisions, sometimes we react, sometimes we become an MP, sometimes we become doubtful. It's okay. That means, that doesn't mean that you are const permanently doubtful. That means, that doesn't mean that you're permanently unmindful. Right? Because of this law of impermanence, so that's why this world is filled with so much hope. Our life is so hopeful just because of this. The Buddha always advised with wise attention so that we could avoid unwise attention. And bear, when, when he said, bear with the small discomfort, he's talking about like during our daily life or during our meditation when we thought, oh, this is too warm. Okay, you get up and open the, uh, the, the window. Okay, you sit down. Oh, this is too cold. And you get up and you close the window. Come on, bear with the little discomfort that you can you experience right now and see how that affecting your mind and how that mind affecting your behavior. If we can start bearing the, the little discomfort, then we can bear the bigger, the little bigger discomfort next time. Then the bigger one, even bigger, bigger one. That's how we can actually improve ourselves. But if you try to avoid, oh no, I don't, oh no, I don't want to face this. No, I don't want to go there. No, I don't want to do this. No, 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 no. Then you try to avoid, you try to run away. There's no, never a chance for you to face it and sorry. There's no way out for you. Okay. And remember uh, in the Mahamagana Sutta that we talk about, be in acquaintance with good friends, live in good place, live in, you know, conducive places and uh, avoid the unmindful people don't avoid us because we are all mindful people <laughs> we are all good friends we are all Dhamma brothers and sisters okay and Dhamma friends so don't avoid us and remember this is very important from the last slide it apprehends neither the sign nor the particulars of the external stimulus which may give rise to unwholesome mental states the sign is the thing that actually catches our attention and makes us want to explore or look deeply, closely, in order to rouse up the unwholesome states. So uh, don't. When you see that sign, okay, there is a sign. Just watch it. That's just a sign. And just be with your, tune into your body, tune into your mind, and watch how that mind reacts, okay? And the particulars are the characteristics of that object that may further stir up the unwholesome mental states that you already have. That's why he said, apprehends neither the sign nor the particulars because all these signs and particulars of the external stimulus will stir up that inside mind. Okay? As like, like the monk who had that sexual fantasy. So with continuous mindfulness, we, nothing will upset us, nothing. Of course, we are not saints and sages. We do get upset sometimes. Don't think, don't think that is a failure. Keep working on it, keep working <coughs> at it. And, uh, and uh, the peaceful and calm rich lady, <laughs> okay, this is just to remind me to tell you a story. Uh, at the time of the Buddha, and unwholesome mental states cannot arise at the same moment when one is being mindful. There is this very rich, very nice lady, very good to the, to the slave or the, the worker. And the, the neighbors always see her smiling and, you know, talking very nicely to the, 
to the state for the worker, and and they always praise, oh, so kind, you're so kind, and the lady is you know flying off, you know, like that, and the and the and the worker say, you don't know how hard I work. I work from six to twelve at night, yeah, like <laughs> you know, like crazy, and. Now you're praising her being so kind. Okay, I'm going to test how kind she is. So the next morning, the, the that that worker actually supposed to rise before the the master, right? Supposed to supposed to rise before the master and supposed to go to bed after the master, right? That night, that day, she didn't get up until six o'clock, and the lady said, "Hey, why did you sleep in?" And the worker said, "Oh, I don't feel very well. I'm I am not well. Okay, you better behave yourself." So, so she knew, right? The the slave knew that actually she kicked her off. So next day she said, "Okay, I'm further. I'm going to further test you." Next day she got up at seven. She didn't get up at seven. Then the 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 masters came in and said, "Hey, what's wrong with you? You are late again today." And cursing, starting to curse her, and blum 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 blum, and, and so she got up and she started working and working and working. And she said, "Hey, hey, you see now, now it shows you that are you really truly kind or not truly kind." Next day, she didn't even get up, and the the the, the rich and kind master came with the broom, and started hitting her and beating her up and chasing her off this. Of the of the home, and she was bleeding, and all the neighbors saw her. Oh, you're bleeding! What happened? They said, because you guys see that she's so kind. Look, I am not well, and I'm sick in bed, and she got me up with a broom. You know how kind she is. So, this unwholesome mental states. <laughs> the the. If you think sometimes you think this person is very kind, wait until opportunities arise, and you can really test her. That's what the Buddha said. But when somebody is very mindful, that unkindness would not arise. But you know that mindfulness is so short; it's just like like this, right? Each moment, so the next moment we could be flickered off by anybody or even by ourselves. So don't blame yourself. Oh, gosh, why? That is where you fall. Get up and start again. That is where you fall. Get up and start again. Okay, don't don't keep sort of like blaming yourself, feeling guilty and 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 whatnot. Because、um, we are the only one who can do this. Nobody can do it for us, right? So, who is causing all the difficulties, all all the miseries? We are. We are the one. Nobody can do that for us. Okay. So I'm going to skip the next Dhammapada thing.、Uh, okay. Quick. It is easy for the good to do good. We all know that. Difficult it is for the evil to do good. We know that. Like that bicycle, no. The gang in 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 Texas was it in、oh, Texas? Yeah, the biker. The biker gang. Yeah, yeah. So it's very difficult for them to do good. And easy it is for the evil to do the evil. Yes. And difficult it is for the good to do the evil. That's what he said in Dhammapada verses 163. So what he meant here is preventing is always better than cure. So we are trying our best to prevent the unwholesome things to arise. And mindfulness practice actually, with the skillful effort, can help us to prevent these negative thoughts and actions to arise in the future and in the present. Okay, so when we have practiced for a long time, and one one day you 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 notice that there are sort of like negative thoughts coming up, doesn't mean that you are a bad person. Okay, don't 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 start labeling that oh terrible you, 
How can you have this kind of thoughts? You should be happy. Oh, wow, opportunity for me to polish down myself again, to actually progress myself. So it means that, you know, we still have a lot of work to do. If we constantly still have those negative thoughts coming, that means the path is still very long. You know, just keep working, keep working, and keep working, be diligent, and be skillful, and, you know, keep putting the right effort in. All right?